Grace to you and peace in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and welcome to our third and final day of the 111th Sprunt Lectures here on the campus of Union Presbyterian Seminary and our Richmond campus. My name is Clay McCauley, and I serve as the Director for Alumni Development. We're delighted to have each and every one of you here with us and those joining us through live stream. A few announcements. Our closing worship occurs today at 1145. Dr. Kimberly Russell will be preaching from Numbers chapter 27 in a sermon entitled Squad Goals. A community lunch will follow worship in the Holderness dining room and all are invited. A special reception will occur this morning at 1030 to honor our 2022 distinguished alum, Mary Jane Winter, and our 2022 Black Alumni Association Trailblazer, Cheryl Blow McDowney. The reception will be held in the Holderness Dining Room in Richmond Hall. The Black Alumni Association, the BAA, will hold their annual meeting today at 2 o'clock in the early center, room 124, called the Congregations Classroom. Current BAA members and new prospective members are invited to attend today, 2 o'clock. Next year's Sprunt Lectures are scheduled for May 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, 2023. The lecturer is Dr. Carrie Day, Associate Professor for Constructive Theology and African American Religion at Princeton Theological Seminary. Among other works, Dr. Day is the author of Unfinished Business, Black Women, The Black Church, and The Struggle to Thrive in America. Please mark those dates on your calendar. It's very easy to remember. Always the first, second, and third, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday in May. Hope to join us then. For today's conversation here in the chapel, hoping the PA system cooperates, please raise your hand and wait until a mic is brought to you. I know many of you are preachers and you think you can be heard. Please wait until a mic is brought to you. Thank you. We thank you for joining us for this year's Sprunt Lectures and especially thank you to Dr. Will Gaffney for her presence here with us this week. It is now my privilege to call on, please. It is now my privilege to call on Dr. Sam Adams, the Mary Jane and John F. McNair Chair of Biblical Studies and Professor of Old Testament, who will greet all of you, lead our conversation with Dr. Gaffney, and moderate our question and answer discussion that follows. Sam? Morning, everybody. Good morning. What a stimulating, informative, textually attentive, and prophetic set of lectures and sermons we've been blessed and privileged to hear so far. The Reverend Dr. Will Gaffney has challenged us, challenged us to think about how we translate text and culture, the problematic aspects of many long-standing assumptions, and the need to have a vibrant, interactive engagement with Scripture. Seasoned by the wisdom of interpreters and interpretation that force us outside of narrow, narrow worldviews. She has reminded us that translation matters, gender matters, and our attentiveness to the rhythms of scripture matter. This morning, we get a chance to engage with Dr. Gaffney in a dialogue to ask questions about the fascinating and timely content she has set before us and to seek clarification on things we have not fully understood. Before we move to that, however, we want to give thanks to the one who created, redeems, and sustains us throughout our lives. Will you please stand for our morning hymn Number 792, there is a balm in Gilead. 792.
us to wake up to your mercies every morning. We rejoice in this new day and the promise that it brings. At the current hour, we are grateful for the opportunity to gather together for the Sprunt Lectures, learn all that we have from these remarkable talks and sermons, rekindle old friendships and make new ones, and have dialogue this morning with our speaker. The scriptures are a window into your majesty and grace, and we long to grow closer to you by approaching them daily. As expositors of your word, give us the courage to be like the women of Psalm 68, 11. The women who proclaim the good news are a great army. We acknowledge that we are living in tumultuous and uncertain times, an era in which trust seems to have evaporated. The role of the church is often unclear, and powerful forces are trampling on the lowliest of your servants. Make each one of us active agents of your peace and justice. At the outset of the day, grant us spontaneity and discipline, laughter and reverence, the energy to do the work our souls must have, as Dr. Cannon put it, and the ability to know when to rest. May our spirits be from, free from irritability, dark self-doubt, and dark clouds, and let each of us be a window through whom the light of life shines. And may we be ever mindful of the good we know, as well as the needs of others. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I welcome you once again to the Sprunt Lectures, led by our speaker, the Reverend Dr. Will Gaffney, the Right Reverend Sam B. Holsey, Professor of Hebrew Bible at Bright Divinity School. Dr. Gaffney's landmark and critical project involves what she aptly calls womanist midrash. The term midrash comes from the Hebrew verb derash, which means to seek. Dr. Gaffney has pointed us multiple times in her lectures and also in her scholarship to the importance of Jewish modes of exegesis and the rabbinic tradition specifically. The process of midrash is a seeking just as Rebecca seeks or inquires of God in Genesis 25, 22, upon the birth of her twins, the rabbinic tradition insists that our conversation with Scripture is a sacred inquiry, a seeking into the meaning of texts. Yes, we look at the words of Scripture or the plain sense of it, what is known in rabbinic tradition as the Peshat, but we also look for subtleties, hidden meanings, double meanings, references to other texts, and for hints of God's mystical presence both in the text and in our lives. Dr. Gaffney has mentioned the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Talmud, and Rashi, all of these sources engaged in Midrash, which is an exploration, a seeking into the meaning of the Hebrew Bible, an ongoing process of discovery. One of my favorite of many things she said in her lectures is Dr. Gaffney's reminder that the New Testament and Jesus' ministry did not occur in a vacuum. It was part of an ongoing tradition. Jesus was a Galilean Jew who interpreted the Hebrew Bible for a nascent group of disciples and did so through a long-standing process of interpretation. Jesus was doing midrash. He constantly engaged the law and the prophets and the Psalms. When Jesus offers the greatest commandment of love of God and neighbor, he is engaging in a midrashic interpretation that combines language from Leviticus and Deuteronomy. One of the most important aspects of midrash is that it's ongoing. It doesn't stop. Our conversation with the text never ends. And now we have the critical foundational work of Dr. Gaffney to guide us in a vital form of, womanist midra of midrash, womanist midrash. I've been te teaching Old Testament interpretation one and two at Union now. I'm finishing my 16th year. And I do not remember a more foundational moment in the arc of the course than when we began to engage womanist midrash in the first semester. Nothing has had a more transformational effect on that vital course we teach. She says in the introduction, Womanist Midrash listens to and for the voices 
of non-Israelite peoples and enslaved persons in and through the Hebrew Bible while acknowledging that often the text does not speak or even, even intend to speak to or for them, let alone hear them. In the tradition of rabbinic midrash and contemporary feminist biblical scholarship, womanist midrash offers names for animized characters and crafts, listens, for, gives voices to these characters. This particular hermeneutic womanist midrash is an outgrowth of my experience from pulpit and pew with the sanctified imagination in black preaching. I have come to recognize the sanctified imagination as a type of African-American indigenous midrash. The illuminating examples we have heard during this, these, lect these lectures are many. Uh, and I'll highlight one of my favorites from the book, the fact that Ishmael is present with Isaac at Abraham's burial, burial. The death of Sarah is described. But the final days of Hagar receive no mention. Dr. Gaffney provides us with the ending of the story, what, with the ending of the story through what she calls her sanctified womanist imagination. She gives us a midrash on Hagar and Ishmael. I'll just read a couple of lines from that. Hagar lived 127 years. This was the length of Hagar's life. Hagar breathed her laugh last and died in a good old age, an old woman and full of years, and was gathered to her people. Ishmael had his mother embalmed and mummified and placed Hagar, his mother, in a sarcophagus in a tomb in Heliopolis in the land of the Nile. The tomb and the land that is around it passed through generations of the Hagrites as a burying place. There Hagar was buried with her man. This is the length of the life of Ishmael, son of Hagar, 137 years. He breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. He was buried with his mother Hagar in her tomb. Because of such insights, none of us will ever read these texts in the same way. We now have an opportunity to engage with Dr. Gaffney directly about some of what we've heard in the lectures and read in her scholarship about womanist midrash, her translation discussion. I'm going to go sit over there, but uh, I uh, and, and I, I just I'm going to take uh, uh, moderator's prerogative and start with two questions. Uh, but I do want to uh, just uh, offer a maybe a guiding principle. Uh, whenever one is gathered among a bunch of preachers, we love to offer testimony. We love to offer anecdotes. Um, I would encourage. Uh, ask you that you keep your question brief and that it actually contain a question. Uh, <laughs> and it contain a question that you don't know the answer to. <laughs> because we are blessed with a, a, a large chunk of time in which all of our questions can be uh, asked and answered. Uh, so we've got plenty of time. If you're on the chat, uh, if you're here in person, just please wait until you get the mic. But be sure, uh, uh, I guess, uh, in the words of, of the, you know, Alex Trebek, phrase it in the form of a question, as he said on Jeopardy. <laughs> yeah, I've gone on enough about that. All right, I'm going to come over here. I have two questions to start, and maybe I'll ask them both simultaneously, and, and you can spend as little or as much time as you want. One of the things I was most intrigued of, about uh, and that I've struggled with and our students have struggled with is what to do with the masculine language in the Psalms. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that more than any other book in the Hebrew Bible, we have third masculine singular language that is used mm -hmm. about the deity. And I really appreciated what you said about not attributing they to the deity. I thought that was very helpful. Uh, but you know, one of my favorite uh, opening lines. I want to. I want to yeah. go back to that. Not attributing they to well, the. Well, not when you said like Genesis one and one and two, uh, saying that you don't want to c call God um, uh, sort of a combination of masculine and feminine. Okay. In one, I, I, I want clarification on exactly where your thoughts come down on that. Okay. Um, so I, I just want to say that I do. I do use they and other non-binary pronouns. Okay. Um, so in. So there, I know that I've used uh, ze and zir uh, in the in the lectionary 
uh, in places where it just seemed to fit, and I've used they. But what I was making the emphasis in Genesis uh, that uh, the divine self-articulation, uh, God as a literary character, if not as something beyond uh, literary, pre presents uh, themselves, and, and I do use that language, uh, as uh, masculine and feminine, and then creates humanity uh, in the divine image as male and female. So it's important to have uh, that binary language in that place because describes the whole of human creation. Uh, you know, think of it as a Hindiades with everything, uh, you know, all the, all the good stuff in the middle in between. Um, but so in that place, it's important. But in other places, uh, other language is going to be useful. Absolutely. Yeah, no, and I wasn't, I, uh, just hear me out. I'm not anti-they at all. Uh, I was uh, referring to the Genesis uh, passage, but I was intrigued by uh, what, what you said about using she, in right. the Psalms in particular. So just to take Psalm 106 as an example, Chodu uh, Ladonai uh, Kitov Kilo Lam Chasto. So uh, give thanks to the Lord, and then for good, for forever is third masculine singular steadfast love. So uh, what I heard you saying is that, uh, you know, you would want to, some people suggest that we should just insert the divine name whenever we had it, have adjectival usage. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, others have said we shouldn't do that, but maybe just a few words on how you have approached and thought about using uh, feminine language in the Psalter to refer to the deity. Sure. So one of the reasons I wanted at least one division of scripture, one uh, lesson category to have explicit feminine pronouns is because of the colonization of God language and the subsequent colonization of the church and the minds of people uh, who talk about God, pray about liturgy, et cetera. And the, the most profound evidence of that colonization is when someone uh, uses uh, a feminine pronoun and there is that uh, visceral reaction, a physical reaction, uh, sometimes a confrontational uh, reaction. And that is because Inclusive language is not inclusive. Creator, redeemer, sustainer, eternal, beloved, all of our language, it's good language, we should use it, but it does not dislodge the image of the masculine God. My white male bearded God is the creator, right? And so again, we know that uh, when we pray our mother and you know, people start twitching. So I wanted one uh, consistent place where there was uh, feminine God language. And the Psalms seemed the place to do that because of the way that people pray the Psalms devotionally. And so uh, that's why I chose to place that there. That's very, uh, that's helpful, and, and uh, as, as we read the Psalms in class uh, in, in, our, in Hebrew, uh, I think uh, it can be very instructive and, and helpful for us. Second, second question, uh, and then for those of you who have, have uh, urgent questions you want to ask, we will open it up. Uh, I know you've written on this a lot and touched on it a, a bit, but I'm curious as to how womanist midrash, and, and I'm just going to throw out a couple of examples, uh, how you think about some principles you think about with some of the more complex women in the Hebrew Bible, um, thinking of Naomi, Tamar in Genesis 38, Esther. As we think about power, race, gender, tribe, and class in some of these stories, what guides your pursuit of the sanctified womanist imagination? It's really going to be contextual. It's going to depend on that specific story and its immediate literary and cultural context, and uh, if there is a dominant narrative in biblical interpretation or the way it's used in the church that I want to refute. So going back to your previous question, I was looking to see if I had done Psalm 106. I think I have, but I found these lines from Psalm 107, which make the same point. Give thanks to she who is majesty, for she is good, and her faithful love endures forever. 
So, uh, and, and just uh, most, of, most of us know this, but uh, just in terms of that contextual piece, uh, uh, Dr. Gaffney's work on Ruth, uh, for instance, the character of Naomi, um, she's written just a brilliant essay uh, talking uh, and, and willing to engage yes. some of the more problematic dynamics between Naomi and Ruth uh, that uh, I think challenge us uh, to not say, oh, this is a story about chesed, loving kindness, uh, and just wrap it up with a bow. Uh, so uh, I've really appreciated your work in this regard. Well, I've talked enough. Uh, so um, let's open it up for questions, even either on the, uh, on the uh, YouTube channel or for those of you who are gathered in person. So while the questions are coming, the title of that essay uh, will uh, communicate uh, complexities with which I'm uh, working. Uh, it's in a volume on, on mothers and motherhood, so uh, we all use some form of, of mother language. Mother knows best, messianic surrogacy and sexploitation in Ruth. Uh, in another version of it, I talk about um, uh, the, and the veneration uh, of a pimp and a race trader in which Naomi is the pimp and, Orp and uh, Ruth is the race trader. So those are some of the issues. All right, you've had time to formulate your questions. I bought you some time. <laughs> There's one up here. Um, Dr. Gaffney. Thank you so much for your lecture in the last two days. I deeply admire your courage that is reflected in my reading of your Women as Midrash and speeches in the past three lectures. Your lecture yesterday evening particularly touched me. As an Asian woman studying the Hebrew Bible in America, I cannot help but have always seen myself peripheral and what I'm doing is un unimportant. Mm -hmm. Even though my intellectual mind um, tell, tells me that it is unnecessary to think this way. Your lecture yesterday told me that the, um, the success behind you being a Hebrew Bible scholar, advocating womanist biblical interpretations and women's le uh, lectionary does not come lecturally, but you have also faced continuous challenges, disappointment, and even rejection. My questions to you is rather personal. Can you share some wisdom with me how have you motivated yourself, especially in times of despair, and to keep doing what your inner voice have, has guided you to do? H how, have, how do you evaluate when is the time to persist and when is the time to give up? Thank you. My scholarship uh, in terms of serious conver conversation. Uh, there are the Twitter trolls, and some of them are, are quite violent and, and quite dangerous, and so there is that. Um, the critique, when I've received scholarly critiques, uh, for the most part, I don't know that I've received a, a, a real scholarly critique that didn't have some merit. Sometimes I agreed with it, sometimes uh, it was, I understand your point, uh, but I do want to frame it this way. So I haven't had the experience of being attacked for my scholarship. In fact, I've been surprised through this whole lectionary process. I just knew I was gonna get lots of uh, trolls and this and that. You change the words of God. I was just really waiting for those emails and the snail mails, because I get them about other things. And that has not happened. Uh, even when there was a review in the National Catholic Reporter and the, um, the, Anglican, the Journal of Anglican Thought. Don't move. Um, <laughs> So, uh, but in terms of just sort of uh, self-motivation in the times when all of life is complex or things outside of scholarship uh, have, uh, have an impact, I do have a very strong sense of calling and I also love and enjoy the work and it's, it's nourishing to me. So the combination uh, of, of those things I also learned to have a very well-balanced life early on. So starting with seminary, where I went to the gym, you know, three, three days a week. I never did all-nighters. 
in graduate school, I didn't do an all-nighter until it was probably time for comps, and I might have done one or two in my entire PhD. You know, I had a massage therapist in graduate school. Um, I have always taken care of the fullness of myself, uh, so that is an investment in mitigating uh, uh, despair on the front end. Thank you for your question. Uh, I think it was Reinhold Niebuhr who said we need to preach with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. Uh, while we've been here, the news in the newspaper has been about a leaked Supreme Court decision relative to Roe v. Wade. Um, what does the book in your other hand say to us about that? Well, let's go back to Advent 1 where the way I introduce the incarnation is with the forced pregnancy and lack of reproductive options of Hagar. I've been writing about forced pregnancy in the Hebrew Bible, the enslaved matriarchs. I, am, I always name the production of one quarter of the Israelite tribes through rape and forced pregnancy. I always name the enslavement uh, of Bilha and Zilpa and Hagar. I always name the incestuous union of Sarah and Abraham. So the book, if you will, the, the capital B book, presents enslavement and lack of reproductive freedom for some women uh, as a matter of course. Uh, in the Midianite War, uh, there, there is a passage that is placed both on God's lips in one point and Moses' lips in another, kill the men and the baby boys, take the girls who have not had sex yet for yourselves. Later, there is a ritual for breaking them in. Give them a month to mourn for their parents. Shave their heads, that's humiliation. And then the practical piece cut their nails, right? So part of what I do in Womanist Midrash and in the lectionaries is talk about the difficult text. And this is also what I do in my intro text, that people know the Bible that's been curated for them. And actually, I don't say Bible, we, we say scriptures, because I have an 80 book Bible, uh, like the majority of Christians on the planet, Protestants are loud and new and have the shortest uh, uh, Bible in Christianity, and that 66 book Bible only comes into existence in 1782, artifact of the American War. Right. So, put the all of the stories, and then ask the question. I developed the language in Woman's Midrash: God in the text and God beyond the text. Because when we're telling all the stories, God in the text may in fact not be your God, right? But I believe in a God beyond the text whom I occasionally find in the text, but not all of the portrayals are my God. And that's why Episcopalians say, the word of God can be found in the scriptures, but not everything in the scriptures is the word of God. So wrestling with those texts, and one of the questions of the lectionary was, if we told these stories through the women, would our theological claims be the same and would they be true? So liturgically, we might adopt the biblical language of God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then liturgically, we might wanna say God is, and who can even name the women? You know, I, I tell you every day, talk back to me, you're never leaving. <laughs> who, are, who are the women that would correspond with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? <laughs> Hagar, Sarah, Keturah, Tura. Rebecca, Rachel, Leah, Bilha, and Zilpa. Is God the God of these women? Well, Rachel took the household deities who were presumably her deities because she was not going anywhere, this man is his God, unless she had her gods, right? Would Bilha and Zilpa, who were raped in, into producing a quarter of the Israelite tribes and patriarchs, say that the God of their slave 
enslavers was their God. Well, African Americans went through that particular crucible. Some said yes, some said yes, but you don't actually know what you're talking about because you've got it wrong. And some said absolutely not, right? So we can't say with simplicity, God is the God of these women without talking about all the things that are missing in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Polygamy, incest, sibling rivalry, enslavement, forced reproduction. So it's already there, and I have already been doing it. Which always makes it interesting whenever biblical is paired with marriage and biblical is used adjectivally in that regard. Right. Uh, you know, that, that's a very complicated, complex thing to assert. Mm -hmm. So I like being the first call actor in a very small, very rural um, very conservative congregation in the South, and um, I would love to bring them what I'm learning here. Um, how? <laughs> <laughs> when I pastored Goldston and Zion Church in um, uh, Bear Creek, North Carolina, um, I translated with no paved roads, I translated the scriptures every week, and I had, um, I had a, a trustee uh, who was profoundly illiterate. Uh, he liked to hold his Bible, and he would say, uh, and I'm, I'm not mocking, he just had this wonderful uh, accent, and uh, this, is, this is what they called me, because it, it was you know, deep in the woods. Uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, it was in Golson, North Carolina, between Bear Creek and Tick Creek, that's what it was. And I said, and you know how close a bear is to his ticks, that's what I used to say about the church. Um, <laughs> And so they would all, you know, call me PASA, P-A-S-S-A. -S uh, you translate scripture for us, PASA? You know, every Sunday we, we talk about it. Uh, those who were literate, they would read their verses and I would read what I translated and we'd talk about uh, why. And so there was no sort of how, I would, just did it. Uh, now, uh, from the perspective of a, a faculty person who does pedagogy, it is important to remember that you got where you were, where you are, after a process of enculturation, learning and unlearning that, uh, you know, as of today may have been two, three, or four years. So don't try to give them the final year of seminary without the foundation, right, in your first Bible study. Um, Dr. Cannon uh, used to say, choose the one thing you want your lesson your teaching to communicate, one thing. And lastly, in terms of technique, uh, I use this in preaching, uh, I developed it for preaching, but I use it uh, secondarily in teaching, and that is people will go with you if you give them space to refuse. So the rhetoric of questioning, what if uh, you know, this story in the Bible is not about what literally or actually happened, but what if it's a teaching story showing us the worst it could be or the best it could be? What, you know, what if? Um, and with my students, in terms of his, uh, historicity, I have a couple teaching par uh, parables. One, I thank Stephen Colbert for the notion of truthiness. And so we ask not, is this true, which, you know, you get headwinds, but how is this true? And sometimes it's literally true, but sometimes it's not. And when that uh, uh, produces uh, some tension, I say, Let, let's take your favorite newspaper online or in hand. Uh, when you read aliens attack on the landing page or above the center fold, you're moving into your basement with some canned goods and waiting for the government to sort it out. But when you read Aliens Attack on the entertainment pages, you're taking your family to the movies. They are true in different ways because they are different genres of literature. And then you can talk about how genre works. Um, and for in black church, I do this one that 
sermons have a good 15 genres in the black church. Thank you for the invitation today, courtesy. I'd like to begin with a song my grandmother taught me, musical genre. Let us pray, prayer liturgy. I'd like to read the second verse of our lesson again, reading of scripture. You know, when Sister Terry was driving me from the airport, a funny thing happened, right? Exposition of scripture. The story is told, there was a woman stranded on a desert island. And nobody, and even the most conservative literalist church says, I wouldn't Google that, that didn't happen, that pastor you invited lied to us. They know how to navigate the different types of speaking genres. And if a human being can do that in, well, I said black church, in a 45 minute sermon, then how can there not be multiple genres in the collection of scripture? So ways of talking through how to process what they're reading. Mm -hmm. oh, this side of the room is talking to me. What's happening over here? <laughs> What's happening up there? So I'm gonna walk over to this side of the room <laughs> for a little balance. So one of the former faculty members at Bright Divinity School, Andy Lester, wrote a phenomenal book that was published about 20 years ago called The Angry Christian, and it's a practical theology of anger. And he looks at various biblical and theological and historical witnesses, including people from womanist and feminist and other liberationist perspectives. So I'm curious, as you think about women and non-binary folk in the Hebrew Bible, how we can learn about the anger through their experiences that helps us understand the anger of God in a way that can help us think about necessary and needed change and the role of prophetic voice. That's, that's interesting. I have not thought specifically about anger, and I don't see at first blush women and uh, gender queer characters in the Hebrew Bible being given permission to be, be angry. Uh, sometimes when women uh, and feminized characters speak out, it's, it's almost a setup for, for ridicule. So uh, when, I get my Rachel and my Rebecca mixed up. When Rebecca was praying about the twins, like, uh, what is happening here? I'm going to need some answers. It's, it's almost presented as you didn't trust God enough, right? Um, when I, I'm thinking of, I'm trying to think of what mother figure this is uh, that's scolding a son, then it's, again, you didn't, you didn't trust that God was going to work this out. So I don't know that there's... One of, one of the Elijah stories, does the mom get mad at her son? I'm trying to remember... Right now, I'll, now I just wrote about this one, the widow where Elijah raised her son yeah. from the dead, because that's right after the, the widow of Zarephath. Um, she, she has a good, strong piece of anger, but she is such an independent woman. The text introduces her as a wealthy woman. She got a husband, but her wealth comes first. Her husband doesn't get a name. He doesn't talk. When uh, Elijah comes around, she says, you know, that's a man of God right there. Uh, why don't we set up this, this building project? And she oversees it. So that's all about her. And then when Elijah engages them, he does not engage the husband. He engages her, right? He knows who his benefactor is. Then he and his manservant, boy servant, uh, they have a conversation about what she needs. Ain't nobody asked for no child, right? Perhaps she did not want to be pregnant. You know, they don't have any children. Yeah. Her husband is old. Yeah. She's not old. Her husband is old. So, like, he, you know, he goes and says, this time next year, you're going to have a child. Thank you. Right? <laughs> now, when the child dies, did I ask you for a child? Right. Right? And actually, when he says you're going to have a child, 
don't play games with me. Don't do that. That's not cute. That's not fun. It's like, no, I'm, ser I'm serious. So she, she is very strong with him, but she's strong throughout the whole piece. And when the child dies and the servant's like, are you all right? Fine. I'm fine. And then when she gets to him, I told you not to play with me. And I did not ask for this child. But what's striking in the midst of that is when the, when the child dies, and I, I say child, but uh, because it's in the art, it can be up to a teenager. Um, there is this Pieta moment. The father places the boy in her lap, and she holds him until he dies. She doesn't send for Elijah. She doesn't do any of that until after the child dies, and it says it was some time. So she sat there for however long, how many hours, holding that boy until he died. Um, and then, then she told her husband, Tell that servant boy to put a uh, saddle on the donkey. He, and he's like, where are you going? Mind your business, right? So, so she has anger in that, but her whole portrayal is like uh, virtually no other woman uh, in the text in terms of her dominance and assertion uh, and the reduction of her husband. Uh, uh, what's his name? Samson's father is reduced, but, but the text also makes an idiot out of him. So I have to think about the anger, thank you, and here. Yes, Dr. Gaffney, um, power, we acquire power uh, in biblical translation from learning languages, which you've committed a huge part of your life to doing. Um, but in terms of interpreting and hearing scripture, um, power comes from experience, too, deeply lived experience of trusting scripture mm -hmm. through the good times and the bad. Um, I had what we called the third row in my Sunday school class, who are mostly widows. And when all my exegetical skills failed, the class would say, let's hear from the third row. And they often heard a live word in scripture that all my tools had missed. Mm -hmm. How do we bring uh, lived experience into the process of translation? So we do it by in conversation and in conversation. I did for the women's lectionary. The specific grant that I wrote for the Louisville Institute, because uh, the question is always, well, what are you going to do with the money, was to travel around. I had uh, consultation groups uh, in the Southwest, in Texas, where I was, um, on the East Coast, in Chicago. Uh, oh, I did one uh, actually here. Uh, we did have that SSBR here. Uh, you know, arranged to do one there. Uh, did one in, Pas in Pasadena with the All Saints Episcopal Church that helps to underwrite me. That one uh, was, uh, we had several, but the one I asked for specifically was uh, to help me with uh, queer non-binary language. And so we set up a consultation there with uh, people who were uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer, and uh, hetero fem men. Uh, so what I did was I talked to different kinds of people in different parts of the country, uh, read some translations, uh, got some feedback, and I have an ongoing uh, working group uh, that is a consultation uh, on a closed Facebook page that is just women. There's a, a working group, and as I'm translating and working something, uh, I run it by them something that doesn't sound right, or I'm trying to decide what makes sense. Most recently, on the Job piece about the clouds being wrapped uh, in a swaddling band. I, I know it's swaddling babies, but uh, is that, you know, how widely known and understood stood is that language outside of biblical circles and outside of, of people who've, who've, ha who've parented? So you know, I was asking them, you know, Somebody suggested baby blanket, but you know, just 
you know, workshop some language, what works, what works better there. but you do it in conversation uh, with people who are ultimately going to be the recipients of the project. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Gaffney, for your wonderful lectures. Um, I wanted you to know if you didn't already that my colleague, uh, Rich Volts in homiletics, in preparation for your visit, has been using the women's lectionary uh, to, for students' preaching text, and he invited those of us in the Bible department to also use it for our exegetical instruction, which we were happy to do. I wondered, since some of the years of uh, the lectionary you're still working on, if I could lobby you for inclusion of the one text I really wanted to use that wasn't yet in your lectionary. I'm in love with these ornery little texts in the epistles, mm -hmm. uh, like 1 Timothy 2 that we're not talking about, at least in mainline churches. Mm -hmm. And I would love to see women shall not teach and have authority over a man in the lectionary so that we can set forth some alternative interpretations. I'd love to see it paired with Prisca's authoritative teaching mm -hmm. of Acts, Willa yeah. or Deborah. So just a lobbying uh, okay. suggestion <laughs> because- uh, Well, so the, I, I do like the idea of using one of the the Prisca texts and Acts with that. So it would have to come in Easter time, which is the only time we'd have that. And I would consider that. I have used texts that are problematic in a, that conversation way. So for example, these, uh, this is representative. I might not have the text exactly matched up, but what I did in principle was I believe that with, perhaps with the rape of Bathsheba, I used in the New Testament what you have done to the least of these, you've done to me. Uh, and there's plenty of, you know, David's marauding, uh, violent texts. So, and, and the epistle might have been on that big, uh, uh, you know, not the violent but sexually immoral shall inherit the majesty of heaven. So I have, and, and so by itself, you know, this list of none of y'all getting into heaven, you know, if, you, if you're on all of these lists, uh, that has been a, a, a problematic text in isolation and used badly, but uh, in conversation with um, critiquing uh, uh, David and his excesses and the church's veneration of him, um, having used that that way, I could, I could see that. Um, we'll see. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if that. Can, I don't know if that can happen in, in B because it's this weird thing of going sequentially through through Mark, uh, which is which is getting to me. But I'm not doing the entire. At, at the beginning, I was thinking, am I going to do all of Mark? It's only 16 chapters, and then you pull out the, you know, the Easter stuff and the Paul Sunday stuff, and you can sort of chop each chapter into two or three pieces. They're going to be long, going to be 20 verses. But uh, I decided to throw some of it out because they were getting too long and I didn't want, want that much text that wasn't woman-centered. So doing, so some long passages, uh, just simply some of the foundational Jesus stuff is, is long with, uh, without women. And then of course I'm filling out the crowds with women, children, and men of the crowd pushed up against him. Uh, but so I can definitely see that. Um, Well, that yeah. That. Yeah, I I like the co conversational approach. I'm actually going to make a note. So while the next person is setting up for the question. thoroughly enjoyed your presentations over the past few days. And you've given us uh, a strategic framework to go back out and, and do ministry. But have there ever, uh, can you recall any mistakes that either you or your close uh, colleagues in the womanist tradition have made that we could take back and learn from? Mistakes in what sense? 
uh, mistakes in, in the sense that um, it was taken the wrong way or, per or, or, or perceived the wrong way or contextually misaligned. I'm not sure this is quite the same thing, but I, w I have a sermon that's still up on my blog that I have, couldn't figure out how to fix. I had mixed up maybe the story about what Eli's bad children and something else, but I mixed up two biblical texts and I preached this sermon as though the one story was part of the other story, it wound up being a good sermon. But I couldn't, you know, I couldn't detangle it. When, and so I just wound up making a big, uh, you know, erratum on my blog that, yes, this is actually a different set of character that I roped into here. Uh, and it's wrong, but there might be something that can be learned from this. And I left it up, you know, I didn't, didn't take it down and hide it. That, that was a, a mistake that wasn't, uh, wild about, but I think in terms of uh, womanist and feminist uh, biblical interpretation, we are going to disagree with each other, but I don't know that I would say that there are mistakes. Uh, the one, I wouldn't even call this a mistake, I would just say the person is wrong. Um, the person who wrote, uh, a volume on womanist biblical interpretation and came to the conclusion that that really wasn't a method or discipline that womanists just simply cited Alice Walker's definition and did whatever they wanted to. Um, and that, uh, so that, that's really not a mistake. That's just, well, doesn't require any further characterization, but uh, something with which a number of us disagreed uh, profoundly. Um, but otherwise, I think it's, we see, we see the, that there's a large table. Um, okay, so that's how you cook eggs. I do it completely different, but I don't say that yours is mistaken. Well, it also seems like you're having such a wonderful, vibrant, at, you know, a conversation on social media, uh, you know, Twitter and other places, not just you, but others uh, about um, these issues that allow a variety of voices to uh, participate, sometimes uh, those who have the more troll-oriented type, but that this, this allows for public discourse uh, that would not have been possible a generation ago mm -hmm. and for interchange, clarity, uh, uh, asking about, you know, I just was, you know, looking last night and all the different ways Dr. Gaffney's uh, scholarship and sermons have been interpreted. There's such a rich interchange, uh, uh, not always rich, but uh, it seems like that also provides an opportunity for, uh, for this type of yeah. uh, clarification, I guess. Yeah, social media has been really important. I, I was dragged onto Twitter reluctantly because uh, something that I had written uh, by request for Huffington Post was being discussed. And uh, Dr. Anthea Porter at U, uh, Porter Butler, uh, I have an Anthea Cordier Young that I went to Duke with, who's now a Hebrew Bible scholar, then Anthea Butler. So I just mashed them together. See, I do that. I mat that that's how I got in trouble with that sermon. I just <laughs> mashed things together. Dr. Butler, uh, said, you really need to be present in this discussion. You need to be on Twitter anyway. So I did. So for me, Twitter started as a way with engaging a public I didn't know I had. Right. Yeah. Mike, there's a question. There, here, and, here and, and a question. Of the At least in white Presbyterian churches, biblical illiteracy or at least unfamiliarity is pretty rampant these days. Um, so perhaps the lobbying moment is to ask if you have an Advent or a Lenten devotional coming out through the coming years, that would be much appreciated from a pastor preaching yeah. each week. Right. But more practically, I'm wondering, since the five years that this book has been out, Womanist Midrash, 
How have you gotten to see your impact beyond the academy? Dr. Adams kind of testified to the impact this work has had on the classroom. But beyond the academy, how have you gotten to see this play out on Twitter or in congregations to inspire, especially adult Christians, to re-engage with the Bible beyond just what they learned in VBS or Sunday school? Right. So one of my intents for the lectionary is that it also be used devotionally. So uh, you have those devotions at hand. And I get wonderful uh, letters about people who are, who are using them. Uh, the woman who wrote me that uh, she's reading her nursing baby, the lectionary, uh, as her practice. And on the other side uh, of life, a man who is incarcerated and doing prison ministry on the inside uh, got permission to use the lectionary. And so now it is being used in uh, a state prison. Um, in terms of womanist midrash, um, I first realized it was having an approach. When I published my dissertation as Daughters of Miriam, uh, my editor uh, gave me some useful advice. He said, look, uh, an academic book is gonna sell about 1,000 copies over its lifetime. I want you to have reasonable expectations. Uh, great, Daughters of Miriam uh, sold that in the first year, and it's, you know, it's still being used uh, as required reading in some places, so with Womanist Midrash, it sold that thousand copies in the first quarter so that I knew that there was something happening here. And it was probably three years before I used it as the primary textbook in my Hebrew Bible course. And I only did that because I had uh, other people, particularly two white men, uh, Ken Stone and Daniel Pig, who were using it. And they're telling me, about it and they're, and they're telling me about their students and every time I see Ken Stone at SBL, mm -hmm. uh, he, is, he is vexed. My students are mad when they get to a text that you haven't done and they want to know where the rest of it is, <laughs> right? So, you know, he's, you know, he's been cornering me and harassing me uh, about that. And then I started really getting fan mail and I get people, uh, just telling me how much this thing means to them. Um, their beloved gave it to them. They're using it in seminary. And I started getting people when I was in events who were coming up into the lines and would start crying when they would talk about it. So I started getting the, the crying. And so those kind of responses let me know it was something. On the heels of the lectionary, because people do then say, oh, what else have they bought? Written, I'll go by all the things. Uh, the lectionary was redu uh, released in, I think, 20. Um, that year, Womanist Midrash sold more than it had in its first year. And of course, in the first year it sells, because it's a new thing, but it's, it's shiny. So it still has a, it still has a life. Um, and I can tell by watching uh, the timing of the sales that people are still assigning it in seminaries and divinity schools and rabbinical college, just because that, I get that August uh, pre-fall semester bump and I uh, get that December uh, Christmas present uh, winter semester bump. So I am grateful that it's still being used and that people are still discovering it. And when I recorded the audio book, uh, I am the one narrating the audio book. I had oh, to cool. audition for it. Um, <laughs> Uh, what I said um, was, uh, who is going to read it? And they, oh, you know, we have actors. And I said, can any of them read the autobiographical piece about my black family appropriately and pronounce the Hebrew in it? Oh. <laughs> Would you record a couple of things? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but when that was released, a, a bunch of people like bought that and then they listen to it and read it and you know people tell me they have it on kindle and in hard copy and the and the audible which i think is excessive but thank you there was the question over here yeah. oh okay well we got time see 
it's just a contraction, 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 contraction in the field um, of biblical translation, interpretation, in, in, in the scholarly field, like in the spaces available to learn and in positions when coming out. But I suspect that's not because all the work of translation and interpretation is done. So my question to you is, what do you see as the needs that we still have in our world are, what are the needs that you see that are pressing in interpretation, in translation? So there was a project, um, the project that produced the Africana Bible was initially, uh, can we do, uh, can we translate the Bible for Africa by scholars, without colonizing and demonizing African cultures. Because a lot of the translation choices that are made in the Bibles uh, that were produced for Africa uh, use uh, uh, associated uh, local indigenous names for God uh, with demons so they could then introduce uh, a, a patriarchal God even in cultures where linguistically that didn't work. Uh, so there was a lot of uh, cultural sabotage uh, denigration of ancestor veneration, just all kinds, all kinds of manipulative and political things happen in translations uh, that are used for evangelical and missionary purposes. So talking with a community of black, African-American, uh, Pan-African, Afro-Caribbean scholars, we got stumped because in order to be widely useful we'd have to use the colonizing language English or another colonizing language like French to have it widely available. And while we toyed with, what about a book in each of a variety of languages? Then how useful is that gonna be? Like, like that's a neat idea. But so thinking about how, uh, how to translate uh, as an African diasporic community for the African diaspora in a way that's satisfying uh, intellectually and religiously, um, that's a project uh, that needs more, more thought. Mm. Um, what else is left to be done? Every generation, the text needs to be translated again. I translate things differently each time. Now, to save myself work, if I've translated something for the lectionary um, and I use it again, because you know, there are gonna be just some passages of text I use more often, obviously I cut and paste. Well, I forgot that about one particular Psalm and the editors pointed out, it's not the same over here. I said, I didn't realize I had done it and I retranslated it and it came out different, right? Mm. So, um, uh, so there, there is a need for continuity of translation uh, as we understand more things about ourselves as a society, as culture, as people in the world, as we understand um, uh, gender and can think more critically. So I've said uh, to my queer community with whom I'm in dialogue that I understand that by uh, being a women's lectionary, that is putting a foot down in a binary paradigm mm. in a post-binary world. And uh, we've talked about that I do that because if we don't hear uh, women explicitly, we don't hear feminine divine language. If we move from, you know, he, him, Lord to uh, creator and humankind, we have not gone through the de developmental phase like uh, crawling and running without walking. We've not gone through the developmental phase where women have been present and centered. So women have either been buried and then in mankind or then buried in humanity, but we never get to the women, girls, boys and men, non-binary sibling kinfolk phase. So that's not satisfying for all of my queer conversation partners. And it's fine and good that it's not. And so uh, I fully expect someone to stand on my shoulders and push it further and it may be uh, that the, the queer lectionary project, uh, which, is, which I don't know that is a thing is in development, but just as a successor project, will be able to do things that I'm not able to do, that our use of language will be in a place um, that a fully enfleshed and rich lectionary project can come next. So there is always gonna be a next. 
want to be sure we get to. Good morning. So I went to high school with a Wilda Carr, and I used to think she was the only Wilda in the world. But, uh, yeah. Now I know. She's also an ordained minister now, I should, should share with you. I'm also a fellow Army chaplain. It's good to hear about that. Who? Uh? Fellow Army chaplain. Mm -hmm. So I think about your work in the, the black church and in the black seminary, um, and I sense that you will empower the women and humble some of the men. Um, so I, I think in terms of places like ITC and Howard and Virginia Union, uh, how have they been receptive? How has how that you know, sure. been going? Uh, and I, okay. I, 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 I don't want to critique, but I just, you know, that's, that's my question. If okay, I sure. So uh, let me say, uh, when I said Hua, I was speaking Army. I wasn't asking oh, a question. Oh, you're <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> That's very funny. <laughs> that, that was a, that, that, I, I know that was that was that was an us. You were way ahead of me. You were way ahead of me. <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so, third generation uh, soldier, uh, but the only generation who was born with the right to vote. My, my father and grandfather did not have the right to vote when they served in this nation's army that tried to kill them. It's an important reminder uh, how close we are to enslavement. My, uh, the reception of uh, the, the women's lectionary in particular because the, uh, the gender expansive language uh, is a push against uh, boundaries, right? And the, the love generation of scripture in black church can often uh, be just quite simply bibliolatry. And so my experience is that the people who, who, rec who receive this, this project the most have been women across racial, ethnic, and de denominational lines. Um, uh, people, I, I did it primarily for uh, the Episcopal church and churches that have uh, that kind of liturgical structure, but I did year W for people in uh, churches that don't use a three-year lectionary, uh, like my Baptist and, UC and some of my UCC folk and just, just other folks, so they could do a one-year preaching through these women and see how that worked. And so what I found from that is that I have a huge audience of, of male adopters and devotees that are quite passionate. They tend to be ex-evangelical, uh, uh, black, white, and Latino. I'm not specifically aware. Oh no, no, I have I have Asian folk in that in that bunch. Um, so the the ex-evangelical group is multiracial. Um, in the the people who have the lowest sort of rate of engagement, it was interesting to me as an Episcopal priest, are my black male Episcopal priests. And so uh, and, and in terms of uh, the institutions, uh, uh, black theological institutions, uh, I haven't been invited to any of those uh, since this project comes out, but I don't necessarily process that as, as rejection. Uh, nobody was going anywhere. And you know, we, I've just started taking the engagements that are in response to that. In terms of, this is very uh, anecdotal, uh, black men that I engage on, on Facebook, known to me and unknown to me, I see uh, the, the, the black men that are adopting it the most, just in terms of my social media connections, tend to be uh, Baptists. Um, so so it's, it's got, uh, kind of kind of widespread, but I don't have that insti I can't give you that institutional data. Uh, uh, I don't have a notion that I'm being you know blocked or excluded, uh, but just not in those particular conversations. But it is my my sense that that liberty around language and liberty around gender is hard for some black men in the black community because that was the crutch um, that, that was, was, was grasped, that, that in the rejection of uh, white supremacy, 
uh, and white ideals, it was not a full rejection, right? It was, I'm a man, uh, and I should be treated as a man. Uh, remember the I am a man signs from the, the civil rights movement. But with that, I'm a man who is embracing all of the heteropatriarchal stuff. So like, let me have liberty to vote, but I'm not really interested in gender parity, right? And so uh, post-civil rights black culture uh, still had, was embracing white norms from you know uh, appearance and attire to uh, the construct of ladyhood. So pushing against gender, gender norms in black community uh, means pushing against some long held things because people performed patriarchy in order to say, see, we're just as good as you, right? We could, uh, I'm sure, continue for another, uh, another half an hour or more, uh, but uh, uh, we do have additional items on it, wonderful uh, uh, sessions that we're going to continue this morning, so we need to bring this to a close. Um, just briefly, please join me in offering our most heartfelt and sincere thanks for <laughs> these lectures. We are so grateful for your presence with and among us, and we look forward to staying in touch, uh, to following what happens with the lectionary project, to learning from you as you move forward with later aspects of the canon, and uh, uh, just again, so thank you so much for being here. We do have a closing hymn. Please stand for number 741, Guide My Feet, 741.